Hey, what's up, Rattlers? So, as you guys know, I am huge into bull snakes and really huge colubrids. I just love them. And that's why I'm here in Southern California right now at Black Pearl Reptiles to visit with John Michaels as he shows off two of my favorite colubrids. These are the king of colubrids, the indigo snakes and the kribos. So John Michaels at Black Pearl Reptiles, he has all of the available kribos and all of the available indigos available in herpticulture. And he's gonna give us a tour and teach us all about how to care for them and breed them and just show off some really amazing kribos and indigos. I'm Dave Kaufman and I tour the world to see how reptiles are living in the wild. And while I'm at it, checking out some of the most amazing facilities and reptile expos as well. It's all about learning, appreciation, and conservation. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. So, John Michaels from Black Pearl Reptiles, you deal with some of my favorite snakes, and I can't wait to dive into these racks and check them all out. So, uh, we specialize with snakes from the drum on genus, and that's indigo snakes and kribos. Uh, yeah, a lot of people are familiar with the eastern indigo snake, which is kind of like the icon of that, gen of that genus. Absolutely. Um, people are familiar with that, but we work with, there are six major species and subspecies that are in the pet trade, and we work with all of those. So. Uh, part of what we would do and would hope be able to share with you guys is kind of what's cool about some of the other stuff um, that you may not be familiar with. So um, Dave and I were just kind of going through things here and I was going to take out Orion. Uh, I, I was a little bummed that I didn't um, take out uh, a rat to show you what feeding is like with him, but uh, I've learned quickly. he's. He's a pretty gentle snake. <laughs> <Is he? laughs> uh, if you treat him with respect, but feeding time he goes berserk. You know, it's not feeding time, but uh, you'll see if you kind of right, look let's here. see what happens. Uh, if you kind of just, he kind of first thing he's oh, thinking about look is food. At that beauty. Uh, but other than that, he's he's pretty cool. Um, if you treat him with respect, he can kind of be cool. Um, he's not a super aggressive snake, but uh, if you hassle him and manhandle him a little bit, he'll. It'll want to kind of show you his boss. Holy crap, look at that. So I've kind of, over the years, I've kind of gone back and forth on what my favorite individuals are in my collection. I've really liked blacktails and and Easterns. As a species, maybe blacktails are still my favorite, but as far as an individual goes, Orion's my favorite snake. I He's can see why. Snake. That is that is an impressive snake. So this is a yellowtail Kribo. And with the Dramarcon genus, yellowtails will get, uh, well, scratch that. With the Dramarcon genus, males get larger than females, uh, which is different than a lot of Absolutely the right. family and whatever else. So, um, so you would never see a female this big, you know. He's a, he's a big, huge male. He's a stud. And uh, he's old. He's been around for, uh, we've been breeding him for a lot of years. So How old is he? He is 12 years old. 12 years old. And um, he's uh, got a lot more breeding years to go. Hopefully we can get him up uh, up in the 20 plus area. Well, that shouldn't be too hard with Kribos. Yeah, if you take care of them right, you know, they, they can be, um, you know, shorter lived if you like a lot of snakes, if you power feed them and that sort of thing. He's as stocky as they come. It is a little something I have to be mindful of to try not to get him too thick. Um, he's thicker than a lot of snakes, so his weight is something that I want to watch to make sure that he doesn't get uh, too obese. Yeah, absolutely. And then he won't be as productive of a breeder and he won't live as long, but uh, working on it. Wow, that yeah. is just absolutely impressive. He's all of eight feet, isn't he? Yeah, I would say so. That is one of the most impressive Kribos I have ever seen. Wow, this is why I wanted to come and do this video. That's right. Absolutely. All right, we don't need to see anything else. We've yeah, seen the star of the it. show, haven't we? Oh, what an impressive snake. All right, so now this is a male, so this is not an egg box. So this is... So in Southern California, it's pretty arid, right? And uh, all of, the majority of the snakes, all of the snakes in the Dremarkon genus come from more of a humid climate than Absolutely. Southern California. So 
Uh, I keep humid hide boxes in all the cages. Gotcha. Uh, you may hear a little noise in the background. I've got a I've got a bucket of water going with a little waterfall that adds some humidity to my room. Um, but uh, the snakes will spend a lot of time in here when they need humidity, right? Uh, which is helpful. So it's a system that we've uh, used a lot with success. So this is Max. Max is one of our adult breeder male blacktails. So again, he's pretty he's pretty big. Uh, he is a little bit on the obese side, and believe it or not, like humans, it's uh, not the easiest thing to get a drum arc on to lose weight. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Even if you feed him less, I, I try to vary the diet a bit so it's not too rodent heavy. You never really know what you're going to get when you open up a cage. They're yeah, usually they're waiting for right food there. right off, and if it smells like food in the room, they'll pop out with their mouth open. Here he comes. And so I will, generally speaking, use a cage hook when I'm in kind of a rush. I'll use a hook just to open the tub. You know, all the snakes are really pretty gentle, you know, but when it's feeding time, they've got a range, man. I mean, they'll come out to here. Absolutely. And uh, if you're not careful, they'll come out with their mouth open. So um, the interesting thing about, in fact, I'll tell you about it as we kind of show him. The interesting thing about Jarmarkon is that they're not constrictors and they're not venomous. They just have really strong jaws. And so they'll bite, crush, and eat pretty much anything they can get their mouths around. And so what's neat about that, what's neat about that is when, when they're trying to kill their prey, they don't grab and pull in to coil around it like most snakes do. Most snakes will come out, grab, and pull back in. They drive through their prey. Right. You know, um, so they'll, you'll, they'll lunge. They don't strike and pull back in. And, you know, if the rat is here and the snake's head is here, they're going to go like that. Right. They plow all the way through it. And there's a, an element of, like, just blunt force to their hunting, which is pretty, pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. So when they come out of their cage with a feeding response, um, something you got to watch for. Absolutely. Look at that beauty. So as a species, I just particularly like the look of a black tail. I agree. I love the eye markings. I love right. the neck markings. And I love the contrast between the black tail and the gold body. Uh, they're really cool snakes. They are As you can see, they really are gentle, uh, especially when it's not feeding time. People will also describe indigos and prevos as kind of being intelligent. And for me, one of the signs of that is that they figure out pretty quickly that they're not being fed. Right. You know, which is handy when you want to handle them like this. I mean, there are snakes that I've had, even rosy boas or whatever else, beauty snakes that if they feel flesh, they're going to bite it. It doesn't Absolutely. matter if you're holding them or not. These guys, they know. They know quickly. You know, as soon as you get them out of their cage, they chill out. They're calm. They're interactive. They don't sit in your hands like a ball python. They crawl around, as you can see, but they're mellow. They're not going to try to bite me. They're pretty neat. That's the beauty of Kribos. Right. And so now, when let's go back for a second and talk about obesity in snakes. So when you have a snake that's obese, and this snake doesn't really look obese, but, you know, kind of chunky. He's thick. Well, the neat thing about Jarmarkon is that they will eat anything. Right. Like anything you put in front of them. The problem in the pet trade is that the majority of what people think and what's available to them are rodents. And that's kind of the fattiest Absolutely uh, it is. prey item. So for me... Um, our, as a general rule, I try to vary the diet as much as possible. You know, um, I'll give them rodents, I'll give them chicks, I'll give them fish. Uh, if I'm out field herping and I see a snake that's been freshly run over in the road, I'll freeze it to kill off parasites and I'll feed them the snakes. What's kind of cool too is that once you start feeding different prey items, you can kind of start seeing, given their level of intensity towards that prey item, the rodents are kind of last on the list of preference. You know, right. It's like if I forced you to eat broccoli every day. Right, right, right. right. You know, if Absolutely. you give this guy a snake, it's like a cheeseburger. They love it. They go nuts. Oh, that's um, pretty so, awesome. Uh, I try to mix in the diet, um, you know, to be able to put in other stuff. Uh, that are just a leaner prey item than rodents, and that's helpful. So we've seen the adult black tail. Do you have a juvie to show us? So I have a juvenile here, and the reason why I wanted to show you this one is kind of a different look from Max, which is the adult black tail I showed you a few minutes ago. Max is what I've sort of called the clean line. Uh, taxonomically, it's no different than anything else. Right. I just call it clean just because it's really smooth like that. But this is Louisa, and Louisa is from our model line. 
and oh, I give them that name. Again, it's the exact same snake, but I give them that name because it has all this black modeling throughout the top, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so just a different look, same snake, different look. Um, our line of blacktails tends to, on average, uh, although there is some variation, have a lot of black in through the top, and as it comes down, the black tail usually goes a little bit higher up the body. I see, and the, and, the, and the belly is a little bit more heavily patterned. And the belly can be patterned too, so these are really neat snakes as well. I really like the look. I think they're kind of underrated. People tend to gravitate towards that clean look. Right. Because of the contrast. Absolutely. But I kind of like this kind yeah, of contrast here as well, to be able to get that kind of black modeling mixed in with the yellow is pretty slick. Now, do you think this is a uh, geographic variation of the snake that creates that modeling? Uh, I've spent a lot of time looking around on iNaturalist and looking at some museum specimens and so forth and I think so. I have seen kind of a, a, a grouping of snakes that look like this in the Chiapas area of southern Mexico. Right. But I don't know that I can speak with an authority on that. I sure. would imagine there's going to be variation in the wild. Um, we've got a clutch of babies where uh, that we actually acquired from somebody else that's unrelated to our stuff. And uh, some of the babies are super modeled like this and some are not. Some are so not. I would imagine there's just going to be a fair amount of variation, but especially in the pet trade. Um, but uh, I have seen a lot of snakes that look like this that come from Chiapas. Still a gorgeous snake. What's next, I figured the closest thing to the blacktail Cribo is the unicolor Cribo. Uh, they both share the same species, Dramarcon melanurus. The blacktail is Dramarcon melanurus melanurus. And the unicolor is Dramarcon melanurus unicolor. Right. And they both inhabit Central America. Uh, one's kind of more on the West Coast, the other's kind of more on the East Coast, but their ranges do overlap a lot. And what's uh, kind of interesting is that despite their names, there's a variation between one and the other. There are parts where they overlap. So you have snakes that kind of have more of a brown tail, kind of somewhere in between a unicolor and a black tail. Uh, in my personal opinion, they're basically the same snake, uh, just kind of a different color variant. Temperament, care, the other things are relatively the same. So actually I don't have an adult to show you uh, because they're all at my partner's house, but I have a sub-adult here that I can show you. She's actually in the blue, but this is Carolina. She went into blue just because I was here filming, right? Right, that's yep. that's just for you, Dave. Yep, yep, absolutely. So, but you can see that she's got, uh, you know, nice golden color and her nice. tail is is not black. Right, nice you golden know. color all the way down. All the way down, perfect. Now these aren't as common as the yellows and the black tails. No, they're not, and uh, you, you don't see them around as often. Not as many people are breeding them, so, um, you know, we actually don't have a huge breeding group of them, just a couple of pairs, and uh, but it's nice to be able to offer all the Dramark on genus. Absolutely. Well, so there's the three Kribos that you have, so now let's move on right. to my favorites, the Indigos. Perfect. So again, it's kind of the same thing. Some people will call the Kribos the Central or South American Indigo. Right. A different verbiage for the same snake, but uh, there are three major types of Indigos. There's the Eastern Indigo, which most people know about. There's the Texas Indigo, uh, which is native to the southern tip of Texas and then all the way down the east coast of Mexico. They actually have a pretty big range and then there's the Mexican indigo, uh, also known as the Mexican red tail indigo, I've, although I've never really seen one of the red tail. Right, right. Uh, well, they kind of have that red on the right. on the side down towards the tail. Well, so. what's cool about the Mexican indigos, in fact, why don't we check some out? What's cool about the Mexican indigos is that they can be pretty variable uh, according to their locality and uh, where they're found in the wild. So uh, this one here is Cornwallis. Um, and he is what you would call one of the red indigos, or red rubidus, which is the Mexican indigo. Wow. And Whew. this locality in general stays smaller than some of the other localities. Um, but they've got that bright red belly. And these tend to come from sort of the southwest end of the Mexican indigo range. Um, so you're talking west coast of, of Mexico. You're talking places like Guerrero and Michoacan are going to have snakes that can kind of look like this. Um, wow. Wow. Cornwallis isn't always the most behaved snake, and in fact, he's already musking on me, so that's lovely. Um, but uh, you can see again, he's not super prone to biting. Um, yeah, if this was cool smell o vision you could smell that really you, you, potent musk right now. You can pick it up. Yeah. 
So Ooh, what's, man. and even within the red rubidus like this, the these this sort of red color phase, there can also be a lot of variation. There are some um, that have a lot of modeling on the top. You can see with Cornwallis, he's kind of got some browns that go up on the top like that. And it's kind of more reddish orange on the belly. But I'm going to show you another snake named Picante who's got a lot of orange on the top um, and is super modeled. So kind of a different look of the same locality. So while we have him out, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what would one of these cost? So the red color phase of the Mexican indigos, the rubidus, is the most uncommon. There are very few people in the world that have them and even fewer that have, that have produced them. Right. Um, so these are ones that are on the highest end of the spectrum. Um, we produced several clutches this year from uh, unrelated adult, adults and we're selling for 2,000 each. 2,000 each. And they're nearly sold out. They're kind of one of the uh, highest end of all the drum mark on snakes that we sell. Well, to be honest, I, I, I would expect you to say more than 2,000, but... So what you're saying, Dave, is I should raise my price. I'm saying you heard it here first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. On the subject of variation with the uh, Mexican indigos, and specifically that red color phase, they can have kind of different colors and a different amounts of modeling. So I wanted to show you a snake named Morena. And Morena is also one of the sort of red color phases of the Mexican indigo, but she's got a lot more modeling she and sure she's does. a lot more brown. Wow. And on the stomach, she's... She's yellow. Almost a little bit more yellow and orange rather than the red that you saw from Cornwallis, that reddish orange. So she's a neat snake. A lot of different kind of looks that can happen with these, so... Um, it's a lot of fun to be able to kind of tinker around with the different color variations and see what pops up. Absolutely. Let me see that yellow. So Morena is one that we're, that we are raising up to be able to breed. So she's still young. Look at that. Yeah, she is very heavily modeled like that. Yeah. And now will that carry on throughout her adulthood or will she turn darker? Yes, they'll generally, well, the modeling will generally tend to stay the same, but the colors in general will tend to intensify with age. Sure. So that yellow is not going to turn red. It's going to stay yellow and get even more intense yellow. It seems like it. I, you know, I, I haven't seen one that really looks exactly like this before and so we're raising her up to kind of see what what's going to go on wow all right i see a follow-up video next time i'm down here <laughs> we could do a whole video just on the mexican ones absolutely we could oh those are just awesome so the other color phase of the mexican indigo is more of the black color phase in contrast to the reds these tend to have very little color at all um, there's not a whole lot of modeling it's going to be black with a white belly or a white chin and um, this is kind of more typical of what you would see in the pet trade for a Mexican indigo. Very black face, very white chin, nice contrast on the side of the face and the chin. So these are a lot of fun. All right, Rattler, so here's where I want to hear from you. Comment below and let me know. Do you like the Mexican indigos that are all black, or do you like the Mexican indigos that have yellow bellies or red bellies better? Comment below and let me know. All right, moving on to the Eastern indigos. Hey, so again, we've talked about the feeding response, and so this is Orlando, and Orlando is hungry. So he'll often come out up, up here. He'll often come out investigating and seeing if there's anything that he wants to eat, uh, and he'll do that first. So if if I go in there with my hand, um, he's gonna bite it, even though he's a super chill snake. Once he realizes that he's not gonna get fed, he's gonna he's gonna shut off, and you're not gonna have a problem. So I'll generally go in with a snake hook or come in and grab him by the back of his body, and he realizes very quickly he's not gonna get fed, and he's in good shape. Wow! Look at that. Woo! Man, I gotta stand back just to show how immense that snake is. So this is Orlando. Orlando is what is uh, what we would call a red throat eastern indigo snake. Eastern indigo snakes are protected on the Endangered Species Act because their habitat in the southeast part of the United States is unfortunately dwindling. Well, you got to make way for condos and Starbucks, right? Yeah, yeah. Who yeah. Needs, 
Who needs Eastern Indigo snakes right. when you have to have someone uh, when you have to have your coffee? So the Eastern Indigo snake um, is kind of the icon of the Germarchon genus, and in my mind, sort of the icon of sort of the colubrid family of snakes. Absolutely, it is. There are two different color phases for the Eastern Indigo snake. There's what's called the red throat, which is what Orlando is, and you can see where they get that name. Yep. And then there's the black phase, and the black phase um, is not going to have a whole lot of that red. They're generally just going to be a patch of white on the throat and on the neck and on the face. That is a that is a very long snake. What is he, seven, eight feet? Uh, maybe seven and a half. Yep. Maybe seven and a half. He's got, again, probably a little more girth than he should. Well, he looks he like a to, big, healthy snake to me. We just acquired uh, Orlando recently. So he's on the he's on the diet plan. <laughs> More chicks and less rats. So eastern indigo snakes being protected on the Endangered Species Act, um, the federal government does regulate the commerce of eastern indigos. So with their level of protection, you can't really import them or export them outside of the United States. Um, and the federal government can also restrict the commerce across state lines. And so the way that works is. If you're going to buy an eastern indigo snake or trade for it um, and it's going across state lines you need to have the buyer needs to have a permit in order to do that right and the permits are issued on a per shipment basis with the eastern indigo and so it doesn't matter if you buy one or you buy ten it's one permit for the box that you're sending because it allows you to move it across state lines sure none of the other dry mark on snakes require that just the eastern indigo snake so a lot of people will search out the texas indigo or the mexican indigo as an alternative right in order to avoid that process right but the eastern is still king the eastern is still king okay so this is an example of kind of what the record keeping looks like for my babies um, i've got every tub labeled i've got uh, cards are color coded according to what type of drum arc on the baby is so these uh, pink ones here are easterns these are rubidus these are Texans. I've got more on the other side of the room, but I want to show you what a baby black phase Eastern Indigo looks like. Yeah, definitely. This is one that I intend to hold back for myself here. So the black phase Eastern Indigos are just born black. The reds actually have some white speckling throughout them and obviously a red throat or a red chin. Uh, the blacks are just born black. Again, there's no real red if you compare them to what Orion was. They've got a white chin, a little bit of a white throat. On some snakes it goes further down the throat than others. But this is the black phase eastern indigo snake. This snake here is only a few weeks old. It's only had one or two meals and you can see how big and robust they are when they're born. Um, eastern indigo snakes are pretty cool. Yeah, no, these are amazing. All right, so this is a Texan. So, uh, unfortunately, all my adult Texas Indigos are at my partner's house, but we can show you this yearling here that we've been raising up. Um, so the Texas Indigos are native to, obviously, Texas, the southern tip of Texas, but they will range all the way down the east coast of Mexico, and they actually have a fairly large range. Right. And they're actually a lot more variable in appearance than people give them credit for because they do have a long range. Um, so this is a girl that we're raising up. And we chose to keep her because she tends to be a little bit darker than most other Texans that you see. Typical coloration for a Texan when you're comparing it to an Eastern is that they will often have sort of a coppery yellow color mixed in on the neck um, that can kind of separate them from an Eastern Indigo. On the throat, they'll often have like a yellowish orange, that sort of a color. Um, that can kind of be typical of their look. This one tends to be um, a little bit less orange, a little bit less colorful, and a little bit more black, which is why we kind of wanted to keep them. But you can see on the body there, there's also this sort of white banding um, that the Texans can have. And you can see also from the face that they do kind of have a little bit more of a brownish copper color um, than that really jet shiny black that the Eastern Indigos will have. Right. Another cool thing about the Texas Indigo is that when you talk about feeding of the babies, they're the easiest of all the Dromarchon genus. They will typically eat rodents right out of the egg without much need for scenting, which is kind of a relief when you have as many baby Dromarchon that we do. Absolutely. So you have to keep 
a wide variety of food on hand at all times. My freezer is chock full of all kinds of goodies. <laughs> we've got rats, we've got chicks, we've got fish. Anything a in Drummark I there? might want to eat. Now this is a this is a trout. Oh, that's a trout. Yep. Anything in Drummark on might want to eat. It's in this freezer somewhere. Look at that. Yeah, you can always tell a Herper's freezer just by opening it. Frog legs. They love these. And bullfrogs are invasive to California, yeah, so, so it works out. You're curing a problem. That's yeah, great. Problem. I don't know if we've mentioned. I'm sure people know or, or have heard that indigo snakes tend to have a very fast metabolism. Absolutely. They eat a lot. Uh, they poop a lot. Uh, these snakes will, with their metabolism, they can poop two, three days after they eat, and they'll eat every day if you let them. So just like a bull um, snake. Their yeah. poop is also not to get too graphic on you. It can be pretty. It can be pretty gnarly. So it tends to be more liquidy than solid. Right. It tends to be kind of grainy, almost like wet cement. And the odor is not fantastic. So well, they have the reputation of finger painting with their poop. That's right. right. They, they'll also spray, so you'll find it on the ceiling of their cage. It's, I don't know how they get it up there, but they can launch. And uh, there's some things that we can do to kind of mitigate that odor. Uh, one of which is that we'll mix into our aspen shavings, we'll mix in compressed wood pellets, and that can kind of really eat up the liquid portion and the, the odor portion of uh, the poop to make it a lot more tolerable. You can see in this room, I've got a lot of drum mark on. They're all pooping every couple days. But Dave can tell you, the smell's not horrible in here. No, no, it, it's not bad at all, actually. And as a matter of fact, if I walked in here, I, I wouldn't realize that each one of these enclosures has indigos or crebos in it. Right. So with other colubrids, you know, you give them a three-month brumation period at 50 degrees. Is it the same thing with crebos and indigos? It's not, actually. I, I mean, most colubrids, they're going to want to bring in the breed in the spring, so you cool them down so they can experience winter, so you can warm them up and they can experience spring. The Drummarkon genius, they are actually more effective breeders in the winter time. So you actually dip their temperatures down a little bit, not a whole lot, not down to 50 degrees generally, and they'll breed during the winter while it's cold out. You know, the other colubrids are gonna wanna breed as you warm them up. These guys prefer to breed when it's colder. So breeding season for me here in Southern California tends to be October through December kind of the early part of the winter there, late fall, early winter, and then I'm getting eggs by late March and uh, into April. And then incubation tends to be a little different as well. Incubation, you tend to want to incubate them cooler than you would other colubrids. You're talking more in the high 70s rather than in the low 80s, maybe even the mid 70s. And with that, the incubation period becomes longer. So rather than the sort of typical 60 days, you're looking at more like 100 days, 110 days. You know, and sometimes I've even experienced as late as 140 days. It's just kind of somewhere in there depending on exactly where your temperatures lie. So during your, you know, cool down period, for lack of a better term, are you keeping them paired during that entire time? No, um, and there's reason for that. So the indigo snakes, as we kind of talked about earlier, they, they kill their prey with just jaw strength. They don't constrict, and so as with some bull snakes and some yep. of the Lampropeltus genus, the males will sometimes bite the females during breeding right. season. It's kind of part of their breeding behavior. That can happen too with indigos, but the difference is they've got such strong jaws and such sharp teeth that they could actually really rip up your girls pretty good. It's something you have to kind of keep your eye on. If you pair them together and it's a little too early and the female's not receptive at all and the male is, uh, that can create a problem, a problem where, you know, we'll need sutures. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a big issue. And every now and again, you'll get one when they're really not cycled together that might try to eat the other because, again, they will eat snakes. They'll eat anything. Uh, so it's something they have to watch out for. So I strategically pair them when I feel like both the male and the female are cycling uh, for the best results and the least amount of danger. So there it is, Rattlers. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed being over here at Black Pearl Reptiles, just drooling over all of these Kribos and Indigos. And as a matter of fact, off camera, John told me that Drymarkon, the Latin name for the genus Drymarkon, actually means Lord of the Forest. I didn't know that before I got over here. So anyway, Rattlers, as always, visit our sponsors. Their links are in the description below. Hit that subscribe button, and when you do, hit that bell so you never miss an upload. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on.